Last week, Pastor Bob started us in a, in a direction of talking about mission and specifically answering the call uh, to be on mission for Jesus Christ and the church he established. Uh, last week, we talked about Jesus' final words, and I find it interesting that Jesus' final words on this earth, as he uh, talked to his disciples before he ascended into heaven, have become literally the first words uh, for us as believers, as followers of Christ, to respond to the gift of grace that's been given to us. Uh, uh, Jesus' last words have become our first words of response. It comes from Matthew chapter 28, and we read these verses last week, but see them again. Jesus says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This morning, I want to continue in this thought process of what it means to be on a mission for Christ as the church, as individuals, as parts of the body who make up the church of Jesus Christ. And I want to ask if, if Christ has called us to go and make disciples, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, if Christ has asked us to do that, then what are we waiting for? Why does it feel like Christ asked us to do this 2,000 plus years ago and we are still talking about considering doing it? If Jesus asked his followers to go, then what are we waiting for? What are we to do with Jesus' ask of us? Our, our, our world understands the if-then statements of society, right? Uh, if, if I touch a hot stove, then I will be made fun of. No, burned, right. If, if I, you know this one, if life gives you lemonades, then, or lemons, I oh, broke it. If life gives you lemons, then make lemonade. Yeah, if I run my car past the E on the fuel gauge, then it stops or I'll learn how to walk to a gas station, right? In our life, if that we understand uh, if-then statements, we understand that actions have consequences. If I stay up all night at a district youth all-nighter on Friday night, then the day after and the day after that and the day after that will be Miserable, yeah, yeah, tired, right, right. In Scripture, too, we understand 1 John 1, 9 is a famous verse written on our hearts. If we confess our sins, then Jesus is faithful and just to forgive our sins. The slightly smarter than a fifth grader, Sir Isaac Newton, famously defined his third law of physics this way. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. We understand this, that if we have been told to do something, if uh, something interacts in our life, then there is a response. Personally, I've always loved the response of the earliest disciples we have recorded in Scripture. You remember Simon Peter was a fisherman, and Jesus uh, allowed him to experience the catch of a lifetime. And Peter's response to the catch of a lifetime was to leave it all behind and answer Jesus' call to follow him. He drops it all and follows Jesus. James and John, the brothers, the sons of Zebedee, they too were there, a part of that fishing expedition. They experienced the same thing, and Jesus calls them to follow him, and they do. They drop it all and follow. If they are called by Jesus, they understood Something had to happen. This morning, we're going to look at Matthew. Matthew, the tax-collecting disciple of Jesus. Matthew, the sinful. Matthew, also called Levi in the New Testament. We're going to look at his story from the Gospel of Luke. I hope you'll turn there with me. If you have your Bible, if you have an app, open up to Luke chapter 5. I want to read these few verses from the New Living Translation again this morning. Luke chapter 5, the calling of Matthew the tax collector. Look at verse 27, Matt, or Luke chapter 5, verse 27. Later, as Jesus 
left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Verse 29, later, Levi held a banquet in his home, and with Jesus as the guest of honor, many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples, why do you eat and drink with such scum? Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Would you pray with me? Jesus, would you add your blessing, first of all, to the reading of God's word? And would you work in these few moments we share together in closing to challenge, convict, and change? Would your word strike through bone and marrow? Would you remind us of our call and help us to lay down the excuses we have developed and help us to follow truly after you? Amen. I love the story of Matthew. I I love that we have this account, and it reads similarly in the other Gospels as Matthew's story uh, is laid out for us. But I love what Matthew experiences in his conversion. Uh, We find Matthew's conversion story is a if-then statement. If Matthew experiences the life-transforming call of Jesus upon his life, then he does something because of the good news. If Matthew experiences transformation before the Great Commission, as we've called it, has even been uh, said by Jesus, Matthew responds by knowing his absolute response has to be to bring as many others of his peers into relationship with Jesus. He throws this party. Matthew experiences Jesus, and his first reaction is that he can't keep it inside. Others must know of the one who called him. As we talk about Matthew's response, and as we talk about uh, the response of those who are called, what we're really talking about, if we would peel back some more layers, is that we have a responsibility as called ones to evangelize personally, to tell others about the good news. If, If Jesus commanded that his followers, his disciples, you and me, if we've been transformed by Jesus, our response to that is to go and make disciples. It's not enough to say we are a part of an organization that does that. The call is personal. Jesus wants you and me to be personally evangelizing people, telling them of the good news that we have received. The truth is, though, talking about Jesus doesn't necessarily come natural to us. Thus, sometimes it becomes an elephant in the room around church circles where uh, we don't really like being challenged to be a true disciple, true follower, true personal evangelist. We get uncomfortable We don't like to be challenged, especially if we've acknowledged or created for ourselves the supposed barriers that we have created, I think, as the church of Jesus Christ. These barriers, these excuses, as I want to call them, excuses for why it is we still have to talk about Christ calling us to go and make disciples. The the reason the world hasn't been evangelized yet, the reason there are still lost people everywhere, It's because we've become accustomed to excusing ourselves from the responsibility. This morning, let's blow the lid off some of these. I want to give us four this morning. Four excuses that we've kind of created for ourselves and why it is. We don't have to follow what it means to be called. The first excuse of the called out ones is this. We think, we say it, we we live this excuse out. Some people are too sinful for God to forgive. Don't say amen. Because we know in our heart of hearts this is absolutely not true. But can we admit that even though we know this statement is untrue, there are 
many ways in which by our daily lives, by our Facebook posts, by our interactions with others, that we live out that excuse. That there are some people who are too sinful, they are too far gone for God to forgive. I think often we as the church, we put ourselves in these lists that put us above others who have done worse things. We've placed ourselves on a, on a pedestal and said, well, I've never done that. God uh, forgave me because I never did this thing. I love how in this passage of Scripture we're reminded that Jesus himself tears away any opportunity for this kind of excuse. The, the, the calling of Matthew, if we would understand in their cultural reality here in the New Testament, if we would see uh, just for a second, if we could peel back the, the time and the bias that we've created for ourselves, we would see Jesus is calling one of the worst sinners to be his disciple. Matthew Betrayed the Jewish people by becoming a tax collector for Rome. He's a bad guy in his neighborhood. He is not loved by those who are around him. Matthew, by becoming a tax collector, afforded the opportunity for himself to cheat other people and make a living for himself. He led a sinful lifestyle. Of each of the stories of the disciples we have recorded in Scripture of how they came to follow after Christ, Matthew is one of the ones who would be least concerned He would be considered too sinful for forgiveness by most who would have been in conversation with him. And yet, Jesus loved Matthew in spite of his sinful lifestyle. Why is it that we who have been cleansed and saved by grace in Jesus Christ, we who have been transformed, we as the church of Jesus Christ, made up of broken people who are cleansed and forgiven by grace alone. Why is it that we suddenly, quickly, maybe over time, but it seems suddenly we forget that this gift of grace was a gift of grace for us in our brokenness, in our sinfulness, in our utter despair. That gift of grace, that forgiveness offered through the blood of Jesus Christ still exists for the worst. It's still good news. If I could rewrite John 3.16... If I could write it upon our hearts collectively, it should say, God so loved a sinful, hurting, broken, tax-collecting world that he sent his only son. He sent Jesus to a broken, sinful, far-from-him world. Jesus isn't just for the ones who are following after him. He wants everyone. That's good news. Good news is good news that God loves this world's sinners and doesn't want any of them to perish is good news. They can be they can be in right relationship with him as long as the gift of grace is being extended. No one is too far. Jesus' response to the Pharisees here in Luke chapter 5, verse 32, expands this truth. He says it very boldly that I have come not to, or I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Isn't it time, believers, followers of Christ, for us to live out the truth of this verse? Isn't it time for us to admit that the good news of Jesus Christ isn't Just collectively for those of us who are smiling today because of grace offered to us. But it is for those who are frowning this day, who are nowhere close to this place. We have a response to take the good news into the broken world. I read a quote in an article recently again, and it says this. When when we read about the protest of the Pharisees, We are quick to condemn them and decide with Jesus. But if Jesus were physically present in our world today, would we as church people, would we as church people be comfortable if he spent his time with cheats and swindlers, with sexually deviant individuals, with gays and lesbians, 
Would we not be infuriated as the church if he constantly went to their dinner parties and didn't come to ours? Isn't it a shame? I'm convicted about this. It's a shame to think that I would be offended if Jesus was spending time with sinners and wouldn't come to our church potluck. Jesus is extending his gift of grace, his offer of eternal salvation. No one is too far from grace's reach. No one is too much, so much of a sinner that they are unable to receive forgiveness. No one is too much of an atheist to not think about God. No one has messed up too many times to be incapable of receiving grace. The mercy hand is extended from Jesus today. Praise the Lord. Some of the hymns of old and the choruses that we sang growing up in church ring true today. We sing and sang, there's a new name written down in glory. I was once a sinner, but I came pardoned to receive from my Lord. This was freely given, and I found that he has always kept his word. We were once lost. We have been found. The gift of grace offered through Jesus means that's still available to lost people. Let's change our mindset to say, woe to us who would say, so-and-so has no chance of grace in Jesus Christ because of what they've done, because of how hard their heart is, because of how thick a wall they've built up, because of how they have stated aloud that they want nothing to do. We know. We talked about the hound of heaven last week. He wants us all. The door is open. Grace is made available. It is not to late. When will it be? Just as in the days of Noah. The door to the ark was available. The gift of being saved from utter destruction was made available and eventually the door was shut. When will the door be shut? We do not know. Let's kill the excuse in our lives that some people are too far from grace. Let's take the good news to the hardest of hearts. Second excuse we've developed over time is that people are not interested in the gospel. They won't respond. You ever said that? People don't really really believe that they need a savior. People, People aren't interested. Back to the passage. Jesus, after he left the town, saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Take a look at Matthew's characteristics of his life. Matthew had everything he needed. Everything he needed. He was wealthy. He had a job. He was living on Easy Street. He didn't want for anything. He had a chance to live his life out as much as he wanted to with everything he needed. On the outside, those looking at Matthew would have said, that man doesn't need anything. He could live his life successfully in this culture, even being rotten to the core. And yet, isn't it awesome that Jesus sees beyond the surface And he chooses to call one of the worst among his people to follow him. Matthew follows immediately according to the Bible. He gets up, leaves everything, and follows after Jesus. And Matthew's response after that is that he invites others to be in relationship with Jesus. He throws a banquet and invites other tax collectors, other sinners, to come and meet this one who transformed his life. Matthew knows firsthand what it's like to be the least of these, what it's like to be a a sinner, what it's like to be gross in his culture. He knows firsthand the type of inward loneliness, the God-shaped hole in someone's heart that abounds in a life of sin. And he has no choice in his life but to invite them to find the same newfound wholeness offered in Christ Jesus. 
We know it's true that people often try to hide the reality of their needs so that others can't see them. We're professionals when it comes to putting on a fake mask that covers up what's really going on inside of us. We see people every day hiding behind the mask of materialism and social status and wealth. Thank God Jesus sees beyond those self-made masks. He alone knows how to help those who are hurting. The good news of a way out of this world's doing way of doing things is offered today. The truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ that offers a way out of the path of destruction that this life brings is what this lost and dying world most desperately needs. The world needs a savior. In a, in a culture that applauds superhero movies at every box office, we've developed for ourselves that, that, that idea that we, we, we love stories of saving. And sometimes we are so lost in our mindset to think that people aren't interested in being saved from destruction. I, I found it shocking because I, I don't follow, I don't follow uh, this, this woman on, on, on social media or anything. I, I, I really didn't know her story, but Kathy Lee Gifford this week was interviewed uh, about Billy Graham's passing. I was shocked as I, I watched this video clip on, on uh, the, the web this week, and, and I was just shocked at how bold this Hollywood elitist was about the truth of the gospel. Watch, watch this clip. Watch this clip from Kathy Lee Gifford. That sounds like you. And what just happened for Billy happened for my husband, happened for my mother, for my father. Everybody that dies in Christ goes immediately into the arms of Christ for eternity. That is the hope of the Christian faith. Yes, it gives us the tools we need to live in the world today while we're alive. But that's why I could hold my dead husband in my arms and rejoice. Because I knew where he was. And it gives you the peace that passes all understanding. And if we don't have... If we've ever needed peace in this world, we need it now, right? And somebody says to me, why are you so bold about your faith? And I was look at everybody's beautiful face right now. You too. <laughs> I said, why are you so bold about your faith? And I said, you know what? If you had the cure for cancer, would you keep it quiet? Or would you hold it and keep it a secret? And I always say, I have the cure for the malignancy of the soul. And he has a name. And it's Jesus. And if you just receive, I talked somebody off a cliff this morning on Twitter at 4.30 this morning. Because he says, how do I know you're Jesus? How can I get to know you're Jesus? And it just, it, I feel so privileged to be able to share just the good news. Gospel means good news. It's good news. And I'm not talking about a religion. I'm talking about a relationship with the living God. They're so different. They're so different. We don't need more religion. We need more Jesus. But that night at his birthday party, Shocking to me that the gospel was presented in such a bold way on prime time. I don't, know, yeah, I don't know what time that was shown. It's amazing to me. It's amazing to me that it was so bold, boldly shared. And the truth is, the truth is there are those in our world that would have closed hearts right now that we would face opposition with, that would not be interested on surface value in a Savior. But there are none who are truly disinterested in being saved. The good news, salvation, freedom from sin and destruction is such good news. When we hide behind a self-made barrier that says people just aren't interested in good news, we really hide behind a self-made excuse, a, a, a lie. If we believe we have the good news, if we believe we have the cure for the malignancy of the soul, I love that little phrase, if we truly believe in the power of the gospel, mustn't we wonder why we aren't declaring it boldly to anyone and everyone? that we come in contact with. 
This brings us to our next excuse. Maybe we believe it. Maybe, maybe we know we have the good news. Maybe we know there is good news, but we, we say this third excuse. I'm not trained. I'm not trained to tell people about Jesus. It's, it's too difficult. I don't know the way to do it. I don't know how to do it. Look at Matthew's story again. Verse 29, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. Can we admit that Matthew used what he already had? Matthew used his resources to introduce others to Jesus Christ. His his home was used, his food, his relationships. I, I said it earlier, his Rolodex, his contact list. He used what he had, the platform he had in his culture. He used what he had to lead others to Christ. He didn't head off to Bible school after Jesus called him to follow after him. He didn't go all the way to school and and then get on fire to share Jesus with others. Matthew didn't wait until the study Bible he added to his Amazon wish list went on sale to begin learning about what it meant to follow after Jesus. He didn't immediately go out and start another church upon his conversion. Uh, Matthew didn't immediately ditch all of his old friends and make new ones. He didn't shy away from an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ. New life made available to lost people through Jesus Christ. Matthew shared what he found in Jesus. And we can only imagine. We don't have the rest of the story. We don't know the rest of this story on who all came to this banquet and what they uh, experienced as they were in relationship with Jesus Christ around the banquet table. We don't know uh, all of the details. But we can imagine that the ripple was experienced. And we know Through testimony of our own church, of our own families, we know of the ripple effect of transformed lives. It's not too hard to share your story of how you came to faith in Jesus Christ. It's not too hard to be real with people, to admit your faults, your hang-ups, your imperfections, but point people to the perfecter. It's not too hard. The fourth fourth excuse, I think, lies maybe at the core of who we are in humanity, is this. We think sometimes I'll be criticized by others or embarrassed if people don't respond. We do a lot. We do a lot in our lives as humans maybe especially so in our culture, to make other people think certain things about us. We do a lot. Around friends and family, around people we don't want to offend, about around people we don't want to react a certain way, we do a lot to appease other people. A real fear, I believe a real fear of Christian men and women, me included, about sharing our faith, especially in a one-on-one situation, is being embarrassed by the response of the person we'd be sharing with. I I get all queasy inside thinking about sitting next to someone uh, on a plane. I've heard testimonies my whole life of pastors, evangelists, uh, sitting next to someone on an airplane and sharing Jesus with a, a total stranger. Tomorrow, Pastor Bob and I are going to be on a plane. I'm hoping he's sitting next to me so I can share Jesus with him. (laughs) Because I know the response I'm going to get from Pastor Bob. Do you get what I'm saying? We're nervous. We're scared about how someone else might respond, about what it might do to our position in our community, in our school, in our workplace. I think we understand and we know the truth that if we're too worried about what someone else might think, about how we'll come across as we share Jesus with them, then we are about whether they would make a decision to follow Jesus, then we've got our priorities mixed up. If we're more concerned about how we are going to be perceived by those around us, by that person, then we are about making sure that they know they have a choice about where they will spend eternity, that then we don't really believe that the gift offered through Jesus Christ is all that important. I think I've 
shared this illustration before. <laughs> the, the best story I have is that I, 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 well, I don't remember how many years ago, we were at a family restaurant. We had my, my, my in-laws were visiting us. This is before we lived in Pennsylvania. We were sitting down to a restaurant after a long day. And we're all sitting around, our whole family, our, whole family, our kids, and my in-laws were there. And we were in this public restaurant, and there was a woman sitting by herself at a, at a booth. She was just within earshot of us, and we had just finished praying as a family. And I looked over, and this woman was visibly disturbed. She was just under whatever kind of stress. And I, I saw her and immediately tried to look away because I didn't want to be bothered. We were enjoying our family time. And as soon as I looked away, I, I truly felt inside of me. I, I can't explain it any better than I heard God talk to my heart and say, go offer an expression of love to that total stranger. <sighs> no thanks. <laughs> my burger is almost out. I've got every reason not to. I've got family visiting. They're going to think I'm a total weirdo. And I remember I, I, I leaned into our table and I said, this sounds so weird, but I think God's asking me to do something crazy right now, and I just need you guys to pray for me. And I stood up from the table, and I went and sat across from this total stranger. <laughs> I sat across from her, and I leaned into her, and I said, this sounds totally weird, but can I pray for you? And she looked at me with tears in her eyes, expressed that she was there and having a tough situation and allowed me to pray for her. I, I, I didn't lead her to Jesus. I, we didn't kneel down and I didn't give her an embossed Bible. She didn't become a member of a Wesleyan church. I have no idea what happened to her. But I knew in that moment, I was super embarrassed. I was scared to death that she would throw whatever she was drinking at me. But I knew God was asking me in that moment, just specifically in that moment, to be his hands and feet and offer an expression of love to pray for her in whatever need she was experiencing. And so I got to do it. And I went back to our table. I was more concerned about my in-laws being uh, em embarrassed by my actions. I, I think I won some more respect, more points for the son-in-law in that moment. I, I honestly think this area, this uh, being nervous about how we'll be criticized or how we would be embarrassed if somebody responded in the wrong way keeps us as the church from really doing what God wants us to do. Jesus, do you need reminded of this? Every time we've seen an expression of Jesus on the cross, it's been prettied up. Even if you've watched The Passion. Jesus was utterly humiliated in every sense of the word so that you could experience eternity with him. Christian, let this excuse go. Let it go. We must never allow our possibility of embarrassment to keep us from sharing the good news. The reality in this story is that there, there was criticism. Uh, in, in Matthew's expression of, of his response to Jesus calling him to follow after him, we see it in verse 30. The, the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law explained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. They said this, why? Why would you? Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Isn't it awful to see that the criticism of this situation came uh, from those who shouldn't have? Those who should have known better? The, the ones who are calling foul on this expression of relationship with Jesus are the ones who are teaching the law of Moses. These religious folks didn't get it. They're asking why Jesus' his disciples would ever associate with such sinful people. And I love how the story is expressed. I love how we see in these verses that it's not the disciples trying to defend themselves. It's Jesus who responds. Jesus who is silencing these critics and reminds them that this is what it's all about. Jesus has come to the sick, to the sinful, 
Not to those who think they're righteous, not to those who think they have it all together, but to those who admit that they are wrong and they want to turn from their wicked ways. Jesus is a friend of sinners, the friend of the sick, the friend of tax collectors, the friend of the unrighteous. Like embarrassment, if we're hindered in our willingness to share the gospel because of uh, of fear of criticism for doing it uh, a certain way or not right, we're misguided in our priorities. As we're called to go and make disciples of all nations, as we know, this is the if statement. If Christ has called us, then we must respond. And so let us will, collectively and individually, to tear down the barriers of excuses that we've developed. Let's not uh, be guilty of saying some people are too far sinful, too sinful for God to forgive. Let's, Let's admit today no one is too far from God's gift of grace. Maybe we've said people are too, are, are not interested in the gospel. They won't respond. Let's be reminded the good news is good news. I love that. Kathy Lee Gifford. She said she talked someone off a cliff at 4.30 in the morning on Twitter. How hip. <laughs> All of us should join Twitter. The good news is good news in a world full of brokenness. She says, too, in that little clip, Maybe now more than ever, we need that peace that surpasses all understanding. We have the best news imaginable in a world that is running far from God in fear and loathing. Let's not say, I'm not trained to tell people about Jesus. It's too hard. Let's admit instead that God has already gifted me with all I need today. The resources I already have at my disposal it can be used to bring him glory, bring, bring people into relationship with him. I, I can tell my story of how uh, Christ did a work inside of me. And so can you. Let's not say, I might be criticized by others or embarrassed if people don't respond. Instead, let's admit, we've said it a hundred times in our life, we are living for an audience of One, Billy Graham had some powerful things to say about his death before he ever died. The only words he wanted to hear, you've read the quotes all week long on Facebook, the only words he looked forward to hearing was not, wow, Billy Graham was such a good guy. The only words he wanted to ever hear were from his heavenly father who would say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what we're playing for. That should be the pursuit of all of us who call Christ our Savior. Remember, the audience of one you're living for. So what? If we're called, we must respond. We need to die to these excuses. We can take some practical steps. Here's some practical steps. Look around you. Look around at your, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, your peers, your family members who do, do not yet know Jesus Christ as their Savior. If, if you know some in your family, some in your relationships that don't know Jesus, I, I would just challenge you, write their names down. Find a slip of paper, write their names down. That's a practical step to admit that there are those in our midst, those in our connections, those in our context who don't yet know Jesus. I would also challenge you to look up Pray every single day for each of the persons you've listed. For every name you've written down, if, it's, if you don't write it down physically, if you don't listen to directions, you just write it on your heart, right? Pray every single day for those who are far from God in your, in your circle of influence. Third, look out. Look out for opportunities to build your relationship with these people. Bring them into a banquet situation. Bring them into Connection with your life as you are uh, living for Jesus. Uh, uh, Find opportunity to do life with people who are far from Christ. Look forward. Maybe find the legitimate way to throw a real banquet. Use your resources like Matthew and share Jesus without fear. We have so many resources. Here we are in 2018. We have opportunity every week to bring someone with us to church, to hear the truth of who Jesus is, to invite someone, not not just invite someone uh, at work and say, hey, you should go to church. That's not inviting. 
you should go to church is not inviting. Bringing someone. Taking them to lunch. Oh, now you're telling me to invest more. Uh, Not doing it. We have opportunity all around us. We have so much at our disposal to evangelize, to share the good news, to live it, to love others. Finally, look after. It's not enough to just tell people about Jesus and to check them off of a list when and if they make a decision for Jesus Christ. Discipleship is hard work. Going make disciples is much harder than going and telling people about Jesus and running away. Discipleship is where it's at. Some have said that a disciple is not a disciple until a disciple has led someone else to be a disciple. Did you get that? It's coming out on a t-shirt next week. (laughs) If you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, you're called by the same great commission as every follower of Jesus Christ has been since Jesus uttered those words. Go therefore and make other disciples. Who therefore go and make other disciples. Who then in turn go and make other disciples. And guess what they do? (laughs) You get it. Would you stand with me? Let's pray. God, we admit, I admit, (coughs) that I've made excuses And that we as your church have made excuses as to why exactly we can't do what you've called us to do. And Lord, I pray that we today, if we are excusing our response by one or more of these excuses or the many others, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to die to that that you would help us to put that excuse away and we would respond fully to what you've asked. We thank you for the gift of grace that's being extended even today. For good news that we have opportunity today to proclaim boldly without fear. God, would you instill in us a desire to live fully for you to share with those around us and the world what it looks like to be on mission for you. Thank you for the gospel, the reminder that God, you love the world so much, the broken, sinful world so much that you sent the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ to live a perfect life and to lay his life down for us. The spotless, perfect sacrifice was given so that we may inherit eternal life. God, as we receive that gift, help us to throw a banquet. Help us to lead others into that truth, into that gift, into relationship. I pray your blessing upon this day and your blessing upon the efforts of your church to be on mission for you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. And God's people said,